first temple ever built over in Jerusalem was the Temple of Solomon. Mm -hmm. But see, people are, are there to believe that this Solomon was the biblical Solomon. Correct. No, it was a real life, live person by the name of Solomon Bar Isaac called Rashi. Mm -hmm. He was the one that financed, like I mentioned before, financed Godfrey of De Bouillon and his brother Baldwin in the first army coming out of southern, I mean, I'm sorry, out of northern France into Turkey. Now, how, how do, uh, because you, you give credence to Christianity, Mm -hmm. and to Christians, but they, are, are they made up, because they're in the Bible, the Old Testament is the Christians, uh, and the New Testament is the book of the Christians, how is it, how is it different? I mean, how am I going to separate? You give credit to one, but yet you say that, that it's made up. Same thing, you mean the incarnated name? No, Christianity, you, you say that Christianity that they mo there were multi-site Christians and uh, uh, there were, were actually Christians and there was a Christian church, there was a Coptic church uh, and you give credence to that. Yes. But yet at the same time you say that the whole Bible is fictitious. It's it's made up. Two different entities. Religion, the creation of the religion was done by time, people, places and events which is called history. That's the ingredients for history. The four ingredients for history is Time, people, places, and events. It has nothing to do with the literature. See, you and I can write literature and we can predate it 10,000 years ago. All we need is a system or some kind of system to put it in. Mm -hmm. Okay? So you have to separate the actual history that was created by people from the fictitious literature. It has nothing to do with each other. Two different things. But you have to, uh, when you're dealing with history, not literature now, mm -hmm. there, are, there are timelines mm -hmm. that, you, that, that, that is involved, mm -hmm. okay? Yes, Christianity began in the 5th century, mm -hmm. starting at the Council of Ephesus, 431, mm -hmm. when they took from our ancient Egyptian divine triad, Isis out of that triad, and created a fictitious creature by the name of the Virgin Mary, giving this Virgin Mary the Theotokos, a title called the Theotokos, which is, which is to mean the mother of God. God who? This Serapis, who is known today as Jesus the Christ. The two creatures were, were amalgamated together. Okay? And once that amalgamation of the two creatures, the created creature, the Virgin Mary, with the, with the, with the created title of the Theotokos, the mother of Jesus, or the mother of Serapis, or the mother of God, came about, then the Melchite Coptic Egyptians said that this now is the Messiah. Or, in Coptic spoken Greek, this is the Christos, or in English, the Christ. See, that's history. Now, prior to that, if someone come up and say that Constantine, or during the time of Constantine, that was Christian, historically incorrect. Mm -hmm. See? If someone says that uh, I, uh, there were Christians in the first century, historically correct. Incorrect. Sorry. If someone come up and say that there were Christians in the second century, historically incorrect. Third century, historically incorrect. 4th century, historically incorrect. When did you get Christians or Christianity? Get first, you have to have a Christ. You don't get a Christ until the 5th century at the Council of Ephesus. You don't get Christianity until the close of the Council of Chalcedon in 451. That's history. You don't get the building of a church or the world's first Christian church until 532 when Justinian and his wife built the Hagia Sophia. They finished it in 537. That's history. Now then you have the literature. That's another history altogether. Because it took, in order to create this literature, it took time, people, places, and events through a process of time, people, places, and events. Now, 
in uh, 1475, you have a Old Testament. But it was created by Moses Maimonides, or Moses Maimon, in the 12th century. He began to write the first five books of Moses, or the Pentateuch, or the Old Testament, in 1180. You see? Which was nothing but an appendix of the writing, or the formulated writing of Rashi, who wrote Sefer Ha Yasa literature. Sefer means book, Ha means of, and Yasa means of the upright one. See? Uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. See, those are the upright ones. See, that's your foundation for the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Then that was uh, from Rashi coming out in, in, in the late 11th and early 12th century, writing and creating the formula for Judaism. That formula housed what is known as the Old Testament. Then his grandson, Jacob ben Meir, who was a Baal Tosafut writer. The word Tosafut means a writer of appendix. Okay? He began to add appendix to his grandfather's writing. Then here come, right after uh, uh, Joseph, uh, Jacob ben Meir, uh, here come Moses Maimonides, or Moses Maimon. He was a Tosafut writer. He began to add appendix to uh, Jacob ben Meir's writing and his grandfather's writing, Rashi. So today we have an old Testament that was first printed in 1475, which contained the first five books of Moses. Moses who? Moses Maimonides. But they don't tell you that. They said the first five books of Moses and make the believer in the religious community believe that there was a Moses living in Egypt, etc., etc. There's never been a Moses living in Egypt. Okay? But uh, uh, that's another subject we're going we're gonna to take up before this program is over with. Mm -hmm. uh, about a, a non-Moses, about a non-slaves uh, building the pyramids. But that We're going to get into that. Mm -hmm. So I was giving you a progression mm -hmm. of how the religion came about, Christianity, how the religion, religious literature came about. Two different entities. Mm -hmm. So you don't ever try to put them together like that. You separate them. Then you can see, when you separate them, how each came into existence. Okay, then tell me this, because if you go back uh, dealing with uh, Christian literature, uh, supposedly Christian literature, you get St. Augustus, who's supposed to have been African, uh, you get uh, who's supposed to have written a lot of the uh, uh, Christian literature, uh, liturgy that we read, you get um, the Pope, you get Rome, uh, the, uh, the uh, what is that place where the Pope is? Uh, all of that, I mean, you get structure, Vatican. the Vatican, you get structure, but all of that was supposed to have uh, um, came out of Christianity. Suppose, like you said, it came by way of literature. You know, that the literature that is used to write uh, Christian literature, or the base foundation of Christian literature, is called patristic theology or patristic philosophy. Mm -hmm. That's the literature that they use to write Christian literature with. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, that's, you mentioned Augustine. Mm -hmm. Augustine was supposed to have been one of the fathers of the church. Correct. Like Eusebius Pamphili, or Eusebius of Caesarea, supposed to have been one of the fathers of the church. Mm -hmm. In fact, the Roman Catholic Church today said that their uh, theology, the religious theology, is based off of St. Augustine. Mm -hmm. Okay? There's never been an Augustine. There's never been a Eusebius. Because if you, I'll tell you what you do, an individual go to their library and you go and find a set of new Catholic encyclopedias mm -hmm. and you look up there, Fathers of the Church, mm -hmm. and they it will give you a list of supposed fathers of the church. And every one of those fathers of the church, they, they give you a date with the birth date and the death date of those supposed fathers of the church. I think it's roughly around 28 or 30 or 30 something uh, names that are listed in that list of fathers of the church of the Roman. And the church, when they say the church, they mean the Roman Catholic Church. Okay? 
So when they give you those dates, birth dates and death dates of those names, guess what, Clemson? Those, all those names predate the 5th century. See? Now, mind you, one, if you're a serious student of history, you have to know when this Christ was created. It was cre Christ was created at the Council of Ephesus in 431. So prior to 431, you had no Christ or no Christianity or no Christian church. The world's first Christian church, I'll go back, was built in Constantinople, Turkey, known today as the Hagia Sophia. Okay? There was no church in Rome. Okay? That was the world's first Christian church. Okay? Now, so when you study the church fathers, all of those names with birth dates and death dates predates the 5th century, predates Christianity, predates Christ predates the, uh, the building of, of the world's first Christian church. You see, that's history. Okay? So that's all based off of patristic writings. What is patristic writing? It's a, it's, a, it's a form of writing that is used to write literature of and for the religion called Christianity. Like they have a uh, perky of both. It's a form of or writing used to write literature for the religion called Judaism. Uh, the Hadith, the Sunnah, the Ishnet is a form of literature that is used to write the literature for Islam. Mm -hmm. See, every religion has its own body of and form and formulation uh, to write their particular literature from. Mm -hmm. See, so now this patristic writings in patristic philosophy and theology comes these particular church fathers or the names of the supposed church fathers but like I said before none of these names existed in human form because they all predate Christianity you see that well what was going on um, that they had a council of Ephesus in which they had to have something going. Well, can we go back to the Romans and come back up? <clears throat> when the Romans, when the Greeks and Romans came into Egypt, what were the Egyptians uh, worshipping? And how did uh, the Romans adapt uh, interplay with the worship or the religion or the way of life, spirituality of the ancient Egyptians? And how did they carry that forward? Because you said that uh, the Romans was uh, feeding Christians to the lions and all that. I mean, try to give me some understanding. That's tr tradition. Okay. Uh, prior to the Europeans coming to Africa and into Egypt, the first known European, like I mentioned, was Alexander the Greek. During the time of antiquity, the peoples throughout the whole entire world, living wherever geographical land area that they may have lived, had no religion, practiced no religion. There was no religion, no place on earth. There was never a religion in Africa. The ancient Egyptians did not practice a religion. They had a spiritual way of life. The Africans throughout Africa did not practice a religion. They had a spiritual way of life. Well, what are those gods? They, that, that's, that's, uh, that, that's an alpha fact. Okay? That's an alpha fact. So we'll get into that. But let me, let me proceed. Okay? The ancient Egyptian paid homage to one, their ancestors. Mm -hmm. The Africans paid homage to their ancestors. Okay? To the ancient Egyptian and the African paid homage to nature. They understood cosmic laws, cosmic order. They called it, today it is said that they, they called it mayat. Truth, justice, peace, love, and wisdom. Okay? So they knew and practiced cosmic order, cosmic laws of the universe. 
they knew that. So that's how they were able to build their great and grand and glorious culture and civilization, by knowing and using and practicing those particular laws. That's how they built the pyramid. That's how they did everything, how they created mathematics, mm -hmm. how they created science, etc., etc. Okay? But no religion. Here come the Europeans into Africa, in Egypt. They wanted to be made part of the sacred society, or the, be made part of the sacred temples throughout Egypt. The ancient Egyptians did not take any foreigners into their sacred temples. They rejected. Alexander came in in 332, lived nine years, died 323 BC. His army general, Ptolemy I, Lagi, called Sotar, took over the rule of Egypt. He wanted to get himself admitted into the priest society, but was rejected. So he found a group of priests and priestesses in Memphis, Egypt. And he asked them to take his image and make it into a god. And they took two of their deities, Osiris and Apis, and made a composite of the two. And gave this Ptolemy one, this Greek ruler, gave him the title and the name Serapis or Osiris. Supposedly making him into a god by giving him an Osiris-like spirit. He still was rejected by the priest society throughout Europe, I'm sorry, throughout Egypt. And at that point, he began to confiscate all of their divine scroll manuscripts throughout Egypt and those sacred temples, and he began to close them down. He housed all of those divine scroll manuscripts in Memphis, Egypt, in that temple that made his image into a god. That's all in my book, The Historical Origin of Christianity. I walk you through the historical origin of Christianity. And this, what I just got through saying, is some of the things that is I've written in my book. So I could uh, take up a lot of time uh, explaining to you the process of how Christianity came about, but it would be faster for you or anyone who is looking at this video who wants to know about the historical origin of Christianity step by step by way of, of historical process than by my book, mm -hmm. The Historical Origin of Christianity, the revised edition. Mm -hmm. um, it's good, we can move. But I want to look at Rome and, and, and how, um, what was happening, you know, in terms of, uh, if not worship, but what did they, the Romans, or how did they worship, or how did they, um, deal with the spirituality, their spirituality, and listen to it. Because this is the second of uh, the continuation of Greeks. You said the Greeks and the Roman were the same people. Mm -hmm. So so please continue and uh, explain it. Because I'm looking at this now, and you tell me if I'm right, as the first time Europeans are coming in and penetrating into uh, Egypt, and uh, this continues on up to today. I mean, this these Egypt, uh, these Europeans continue to grow and to expand. Um, I'm, I'm just looking at the progression of history, but I want to look at it as interplaying with um, with the religion, because the religion plays such a important role in it. Because we later on um, get uh, out of that the the Catholic Church, and I just want to know how that develops, uh, how that ends up being. Um, all over the world and supposed to have came out of this uh, um, uh, Council of Nicaea. And, you know, how did it develop? How did it develop? What were people worshipping then? I mean, you know, they said it's the Romans fed Christians to the lions and all of that. Just kind of explain all that stuff. Was it true? Well, I, I, uh, uh, no, it's not true. <clears throat> but my book, like I said, explains the progression of how Christianity came about. 
and I'll take you, I will take you into the, the various council meetings, the ecumenical council meetings that did exist in Northeast Africa, in Turkey, such as the Council of Nicaea I, which is called the Nicene Council, or uh, the Homogeous Council, okay? Uh, the second council was called the Council of uh, Constantinople I, 381. Uh, the third council was the Council of Ephesus, 431. The, the fourth council was the Council of Chalcedon, 451. The fifth council was the Council of, Chal uh, of Constantinople II, 553. I'll walk you through that, but I think where you're getting a little confused is that you, among other people throughout the world, think that it was a church in Rome. It never was a church in Rome. Not until the 15th century. 15th century. No, no church. When I said no church, I mean there was no seat of Christianity. There was no Vatican. There was no seat of Christianity. The Vatican in Rome today is the seat of Christianity. There was no Vatican until the 15th century. Okay? So when the Greeks and the Romans came in, what they did was to assimilate the culture and the civilization and the ways of the ancient Egyptian by way of assimilation. See that? Okay. So, no church now. You don't get a church nowhere on earth until the 6th century when Justinian and his wife Theodora built the world's first Christian church which is known as the Hagia Sophia, the Church of the Holy Wisdom, which is another name for Jesus the Christ. Built in 532, finished in 537. But in the meantime, there was no church in the Vatican as being the seat of Christianity. Mm -hmm. The seat of Christianity yeah. was in Northeast Africa, in Constantinople, in a church and university that is known as the Hagia Sophia, that served as the world's first Christian church and the world's first European university. And the teaching staff at the Hagia Sophia were Africans. They were male Coptic Ky 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 Egyptian Africans. And they're the ones that taught the Europeans. You see, George G.M. James came out, the Stolen Legacy, saying that the Greeks studied with the ancient Egyptians. That's not that's historically incorrect. Because the ancient Egyptians would never take, ever take a foreigners into their priest society to teach them anything, their sacred society. Secondly, the Greeks had no alphabet, they were illiterate people. Third, they were uncivilized savages. So what are you going to do if they took a Greek who was uncivilized, savage, who had no alphabet, and take them into their sacred temples to teach them? What are they going to teach them? A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, kindergarten. They didn't do that. So the first learning institution for the European that ever existed on planet Earth was the Hagia Sophia. And the teacher's staff was African. Okay? Now, in the meantime, there was no church in Rome that could be identified as the seat of Christianity. No, it was in Constantinople, Turkey, the Hagia Sophia. Now, Justinian wanted to become head of that church after he built it. And the only way that he could become head of that church and have the ecclesiastical power over that church, as well as political power, he had to take the donation of Constant. Building the Hagia Sophia. Agapitus I, he was the African, the Melchite African, that had uh, ecclesiastical authority by way of the donation of Constantine. See? The donation of Constantine is explained in my book. But he had ecclesiastical authority by way of the donation of Constantine. The donation of Constantine was a donation or an agreement given to Sylvester I by Juan Constantine in 313 and 14 ABCE. Okay? 
And that gave uh, uh, the Coptic community in uh, Turkey and then throughout Egypt, because that was Egypt was part of the Byzantine Empire, ecclesiastical authority over each other. In other words, over uh, uh, by the donation of Constantine being given to Sylvester I, who was a Melkite Coptic Egyptian. Uh, Constantine gave him his imperial authority on a temporal basis, meaning that he wanted Sylvester to get the rest of the Coptic Egyptians to worship this Serapis image that is known today as Jesus the Christ. Mm -hmm. See, from the time of Ptolemy, one, Lagi, who the image was made as into Serapis, every Ptolemy and Ptolemaic ruler and Roman ruler who sat on the throne to rule Egypt, sat on the throne as the as the vicar of Serapis. Just like the Pope in Rome sits on the on the throne of Peter. Okay, by way of the supposed authority of Peter to be the vicar of Christ. You see? So now uh, the donation of Constantine was very important because he, he gave this his imperial emblems over an authority to this Melkite Coptic African uh, uh, Sylvester I and made Sylvester the head H-N-I-C in, in modern terms, okay, over the rest of the Coptic Egyptian. All he wanted for himself was to be baptized and made part of that community, you see? So that donation of Constantine stayed into power ecclesiastical power from 313 all the way up until uh, 553. You see? When Justinian took it back at that point with the help of another African, Theodore Asidus. You see? But that, that's all in my book. But anyway, you see? So now, during the time of Justinian, prior to him building the Hagia Sophia, uh, Agapetus I, who was a Melkite Coptic African Egyptian, had ecclesiastical power. Well, guess what ha happened to Agapetus? He died mysteriously because Justinian had him killed. Then, then the ecclesiastical authority, by way of the donation of Constantine, went to one Silverius. <coughs> and guess what happened to Silverius? No. He was. He was, he was brought up on charges for treason against the government. Justinian had his army general and, and, and the general's wife to bring treason charges against Silvius. So he was eliminated. He eventually died. Okay. Then the donation of Constantine went to the only African true Pope of the Roman Catholic Church, and that was Vigilius. What period? Fifth century. I'm sorry, sixth century. <coughs> sixth century. Vigilius. Okay? Wait now, let me, let me get through, because I'm, I'm about to tell you something very, very important okay. to clear your mind up now about this. So if I had to tell you all this, I had to bring you through a progression of history so you can really understand how the picture evolved. began to evolve. Right. Okay. Now, here come, uh, during the time of Vigilius, Justinian had completed building the world's first Christian church, the Hagia Sophia. So by Vigilius having ecclesiastical authority, that made him officially the world's fir first pope of that church. Okay? Well, he was the world's first pope of the Christian church. Okay? But he was an African. Okay? And, 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 and Justinian, by him building that church, wanted to take back the donation of Constantine. You know what they did? They tried, with the help of Theodore Sidus, a Melkite Coptic Uncle Tom African, told Just Justinian, how to get rid of Vigilius. 
You know what they tried to do? They tried to tell him. They went to Vagirius and said, listen, I want you, Vagirius, to have communion with the monophysites. The monophysites was the enemy of the Christians, the diaphysitic Christians. Because the monophysites said that that Christ, that the diaphysitic Christians worship, had no human nature. You see? So he wanted Vagilius to have communion with him. That was a trick. Vagilius didn't, didn't fall for that. You see? So they eventually hounded him and hounded him until they killed him. And uh, Justinian got control of the donation of Constantine. And he, by controlling, getting control of the donation of Constantine, he got control of the ecclesiastical authority of that particular church. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is what's happening. Now listen to this now. When he got ecclesiastical authority, he himself appointed patriarchs of the Hagia Sophia. Okay? Not popes. See? Patriarch. A patriarch is an individual who is, who is a bishop of the Hagia Sophia. And he also appointed the patriarch of Constantinople. But you got two different patriarchs. You got two different uh, factions over there in, in, in that region of the world, in Turkey and in Egypt, all in Northeast Africa. The two factions is one, you have a, 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 a diaphysitic faction arguing the the monophysitic faction. The monophysite said that this, this Christ had no human nature. The diaphysitic said that Christ had two natures, a, spirit, a spiritual nature and a human nature. See, you got those two, those two arguments, right? So to try to keep peace, he appointed the patriarch of the Hagia Sophia and the patriarch of Constantinople. The patriarch of Constantinople was a monophysite bishop. The patriarch of the Hagia Sophia was a diaphysitic bishop. See that? See? Just like the Republicans and the Democrats. That's what it was. Now, the Hagia Sophia and the patriarch of the Hagia Sophia represented the West. The West being what? Europe. See? No Christian Church, no seat of Christianity was over there. The seat of Christianity was in Northeast Africa, in Constantinople, known as the Hagia Sophia. Okay? See? So now, uh, you have to also understand that was Jacob uh, Baradez, also a.k.a. as James Baraday, around. Jacob Baradez was a pet of Theodora. See? She financed his living, his, his, his existence, but he was a monophysite. Mm -hmm. But when, in, see, the, 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 the Hagia Sophia was built in, in what year? 532. In 532, something else happened in history. What happened in history was the Nika Rise, N I K K A. The Nika Rise began. What was the writing about? These are European Arabs living over in Constantinople, in and around Turkey, mm -hmm. in and around Constantinople, rather. Mm -hmm. They broke out into a riot. Okay? The same year that Justinian began to build the Hagia Sophia. And uh, Justinian, the riot got so intense and so bad that he was about to give up his throne until his wife Justinian, I'm sorry, until his wife Theodora told him, said, no, you don't give up your throne. You go and get our army general and let him take care of the situation. The army general of Justinian rounded up 30,000 men, women, and children and took them and put it, them in the Hippodrome. The Hippodrome is like a big stadium, sports stadium. Mm -hmm. And they killed 30,000 men, women, and children. And that brought that riot down. Had Justinian given up his throne, his Byzantine uh, empire, 
At that time, the Hagia Sophia would have never been completed or built. Because that was the very first year he began building it in 532 when that riot broke out. Among those European Arabs. Okay? Now, let me go a little further. A rich prince by the name of Ibn Harith Gobala came to Theodora, the wife of Justinian, and said, Listen, send someone to evangelize among my people, among us, us Arabs. See that? And she went and got one of her pets, Jacob Baradez, known as Jacob Baradez. And she built for him, in 543, a church that is known today as the Jacobite Church. See, when, when, when let's go back in history, when uh, Ptolemy I Lagi, uh, when his image was refused by the Coptic Egyptian uh, priest society, or the ancient Egyptian priest society in Egypt. He closed those temples down, but he forbid any ancient Egyptian to build any type of building or building for the purpose of religious worship or for any type of uh, spiritual gathering. They had to resort to their homes for spiritual fellowship and to the cemetery where they buried their dead. Okay. Now, so therefore, all the way up until that time, we're talking about in uh, uh, 323 BCE, all the way up until 543 ACE, when Theodora and Justinian built a church in Syria for Jacob Baradez. And later that church was named the Jacobite Church. It was a Coptic church. So you want to know when the world's first Coptic church was erected? 543 in Syria. Well, guess what kind of church it was? It was a monophysite church, not a Christian church. Not a diaphysite Christian. It was a monophysite church. See, this is where our people in the African community get thrown off. See, they think that the Coptic church was in Ethiopia. No. No, no. See, because they always uh, assimilate Coptic with Christianity. Right, right. No, no. Right. Okay? Yeah. See, but the Coptic church, the world's first Coptic church, was built in Syria mm -hmm. by... Theodora and Justinian for Jacob Baradez, a.k.a. as James Baradez, in 543, for him to use as a headquarters to gather his uh, missionary group, which contained 160 bishops and clergymen and women, to go out among the European Arabs and evangelize among them. Because those uh, European Arabs did not want to become Christians because they were not satisfied with the Byzantine emperors. And the reason why they were not satisfied with the Byzantine emperors, it goes all the way back to a nastiest one in 517. In 517, the Byzantine ruler, a nastiest one, condemned and stopped gladiator competition in the Hippodrome, in the stadium. And that was a, a sport just as popular as football in America today. Can you imagine the President of the United States uh, outlawing and abolishing football? This whole country go up in, in smoke. Yeah. You see? So now, let me, don't, don't say nothing, let me, add, let, me, let, me, let me go on. So, uh, he abolished gladiator competition. When he died in 518, 
his successor, his, uh, his nephew, Justin, came into power. And he kept that abolishment in place. When Justin died, his nephew came into power, Justin Yuan, and he kept that going. That's the reason why the Nika riot came about in 532, because they were all mad at the, at the Byzantine ruler for stopping uh, the gladiator competition over there, you see? And I'm bringing that all out in my book called The Historical Origin of Islam, There's Never Been a Man That Ever Walked to Earth in Human Form of Blame of Prophet Muhammad. You see that? Now, so now, uh, Justinian has built the Hagia Sophia, right? Mm -hmm. He wants everybody to join and become a Christian. And these Arabs says, no, no way. Okay? So that's when Theodora got Jacob Bardez, her African Melkite uh, pet, to go and evangelize among these Arabs. Mm -hmm. So Jacob Bardez, uh, Theodora built the world's first Coptic church, which was a monophysite church in Syria in 543. He got 160 bishops and, and other clergymen and, and females. And the females, mm -hmm. guess, the females were nuns. Mm -hmm. They were called nuns, or better known, they were called virgins. Because the, the Melkite Coptic religious community practice celibacy. The exterior Coptic religious community practice celibacy. Jacob Bardez and his group, they all practice celibacy. And I told you that the, uh, the teaching staff in the Hagia Sophia comprised of the African Melkite Africans, right? Mm -hmm. They all practice celibacy. Mm -hmm. And, the, and the, uh, the Hagia Sophia is nothing but an extension of Western Christianity in Rome. The seat of the Vatican, or the seat of Christianity, is in the Vatican. And the Pope and, the, uh, and his hierarchy, what do they practice? They practice supposedly celibacy, don't they? Mm -hmm. You see, that's, a, that's where they got it from, the African mm -hmm. religious community. Mm -hmm. Okay, now when James Barday began to evangelize among these Arabs, mm -hmm. he was teaching them a monophysitic theology. Mm -hmm. See, they were monophysites. Mm -hmm. They did not believe in the two natures of this Christ. They were all monophysites. Okay? And then through the years, they began to physically fight the Byzantine emperors. Physically. The African monophysites only argued among themselves. They never uh, related or uh, uh, stooped to, to violence. They, they argued among themselves by way of a polemic. But these Arabs, these European Arabs, who are known in history as the Seracian Arabs and the Seljukian Turks, they fought in physical form to, to try to destroy the Byzantine Empire, try to destroy the Hagia Sophia, etc., etc. Just tell me, who are the Arabs? What are they made up of? Are they Africans and uh, No, they're Indo-European. Arabs and Indo-European. The, 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 the Arabs today are considered Indo-European. A mixture of Europeans and Indians, Pakistanians, Afghanians, etc. etc. Okay, but originally when Alexander the Greek came into Egypt in 332 BCE. Uh, <clears throat> the Europeans began to come into Africa and into Egypt and into Turkey and into Iraq and Iraq, Iran and Iraq in large numbers. They came out of the Slavic southern areas of Europe. They came out of Bulgaria, they 
came out of Yugoslavia, Albania, Hungary, they came out of Greece, they came out of southern Russia via the way into Iran and Iraq. Okay? And then through the years, uh, uh, the people of India, under the influence of Islam, began to mingle. Under the influence of Islam? Islam yeah. But Islam don't go back that far. That's right. But I'm saying in later years, I say, under, under the influence of monophysitic teaching, put it like that, that later became Islam. Mm -hmm. See? Okay. See, uh, in order to, uh, like I, if you ask a Muslim, uh, in order for you to understand anything about Islam, you have to, you really have to know the historical origin of, of Christianity first. Mm -hmm. Correct. And then you got to know uh, the historical origin of the monophysite. Mm -hmm. See? So for monophysitic Christianity, or for monophysitic theology, came Muhammadism slash Islam, mm -hmm. but that goes into another story. But let me let me let me let me let me, uh, let me uh, finish here, then I'll let you continue. Mm -hmm. So you see, Clemson, there was no seat for Christianity in Europe in Rome. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, with all that fighting going over there, I'm jumping ahead now. We're going, going into the time of the Crusades. Mm -hmm. Okay. With all that fighting going in over there, in that region of the world, we're talking about Northeast Africa and Turkey and uh, Egypt and all across North Africa, the Seljukian Turks fighting the, the Byzantine rulers and fighting the other Europeans coming into that region to try to take land. Okay? Under the under the disguise of trying to say we're coming over here to protect Christianity, they could give less than a damn about Christianity. They came over there to take land. That's what they wanted. Like I explained prior to that. Now, the Hagia Sophia, the picture of the of the Hagia Sophia, I told you, represented Europe or Western Christianity. The patriarch of Constantinople represented the monophysite. You heard of the Greek Orthodox Church? Yes. Or the Eastern Orthodox Church? Mm -hmm. The Greek Orthodox Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church, anything that says uh, Greek Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox, etc., etc., that means that that church uh, follows a guideline of one Phocius. Okay, Phocius was a patriarch of Constantinople who was a monophysite patriarch. Phocius in the ninth century, 869-870. Uh, one, he did not recognize the patriarch of the Hagia Sophia. Did not recognize him. They argued all the time. Number two, he refused to accept the philoquy in the creed. Mm -hmm. And the word philoquy means he refused to accept the Son, which is known as Christ, in the Creed. What Creed? The Homogeneous Creed, or the Nicene Creed, that was created in 325. And he refused to practice celibacy. So now in 1054 comes uh, a Greek Orthodox Church, okay, using the formula or the, uh, or the doctrine of the patriarch of Constantinople. Mm -hmm. In other words, the Greek Orthodox Church refused to accept Christ. And that's all been changed today. But I'm talking about back in the, in the, in the middle of the 11th century, 1054. Mm -hmm. They refused to accept the philoquy, or the philoquy meaning Christ, as being the son of of God, and God was Osiris as being the God, coming out of the ancient Egyptian divine triad. Okay? See, so you have to understand that. See, a lot of people don't know that. They don't realize that. But to know the difference between uh, uh, 
the, uh, the, the Patriarch of, uh, of Constantinople and the Patriarch of the Hagia Sophia. Okay, all together different. Okay, now with all the fighting during the time of the Crusades, when the Seljukian Turks was really uh, kicking butts over there, every army came over there, they ran them out. You know, it was they, they was in control. Okay, so it was it was it was intimate that the Hagia Sophia was going to fall, was going to be destroyed. Okay? So therefore, the Europeans in Europe began to try to find and move the seat of Christianity out of Northeast Africa into Europe. You see that? They knew that the Hagia Sophia was going to fall because she had all that fighting going on, on over there. The Hagia Sophia was like an island surrounded by monophysites, by the enemy. Just a matter of time. So you know what they did? To prepare the Europeans in France, they began to build in 1163 the Church of Notre Dame. In 1230, they finished that church in Paris, France. That was going to be the seat of Christianity, but it never got off the ground for that purpose, even though they finished Notre Dame, mm -hmm. and it's gone on to be just a regular church. Mm -hmm. Okay, but that was going to be the seat of Christianity. Mm -hmm. You see? Now, where was the ecclesiastical power of the seat of Christianity? Well, no, no. The Hagia Sophia. Yeah, okay, yeah. You see that? Turkey. In Turkey. Mm -hmm. They're trying to, they know that it, it is just a matter of time before the Hagia Sophia is going to be destroyed. Mm -hmm. So they began to prepare another seat in Europe for it. That's when I told you they began to build the Church of Notre Dame in 1163 and finish it in 1230. Mm -hmm. But it didn't come off that way. But now, in the meantime, who had the ecclesiastical power? Over that seat of Christianity, a church who uh, who was who had the seat of Christianity was the Byzantine ruler. So John eight, I'm gonna jump a little bit. John eight and 1439. You know what he did? He merged the Eastern Church with with the West. And at that point, he gave up ecclesiastical authority. In 1439, six years later, you know what they was doing in Rome, on the outskirts of Rome? They was building St. Peter's Church that is known as St. Peter's Basilica, mm -hmm. who is today is the seat of European Roman Christianity. It's the seat of, of, of Roman Christianity. In 1445. See that? Yeah. Eight years after the beginning of St. Peter's Church, which, which took them 181 years to build what is known as the Vatican. They built it on the outskirts of Rome over the catacombs. They wanted to, to, to build over the catacombs because they wanted to build over a supposed tomb of Peter. Peter is the one that gives the Pope today the authority, the ecclesiastical authority to be the vicar of Christ. So he gets his authority from Peter. And if you go to, into the Vatican and, and St. Peter's Basilica, the Pope sits on his throne in front of steps leading down into the catacomb where the supposed burial place of Peter took place. Never been a Peter. See, but this is what's happening today. See, so a lot of people think that this church has been over there all these years. No, that's been the seat of Christianity. No. The seat of Christianity was in Northeast Africa in the Hagia Sophia. Mm -hmm. Okay? Well, uh, since you, you, you know, you got up to, uh, to uh, 10 hundred and so forth, but isn't Islam supposed to have uh, come about in 640 uh, A.D.? 
somewhere around there. How does how does Islam interpret this? See, that's what you're saying is you're using traditional literature, mm -hmm. the stories that are attached in traditional uh, religious Islamic literature. Mm -hmm. They're saying that a prophet Muhammad was born in Mecca in 570 and died in Medina and was buried in Medina in uh, 632. That's tradition. It's never been a prophet Muhammad. That's historically incorrect. Okay? Uh, my book, The Historical Origin of Islam, will bring all that out. To spell all of that. Uh, in my book, Historical Origin of Islam, there's never been a man who walked away from human form by the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, I'm going to bring out some, some very shocking, surprising things mm -hmm. to our African community. Mm -hmm. Okay? And I will go into that in, 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 in uh, uh, detail. Mm -hmm. Okay? Can you give us a quick peek just so I can know well, where Islam comes from. Yeah, Islam first uh, comes from monophysitic. Christianity. That's what you have to understand. Yeah, yeah, okay. It's kind of continuation. Right. It's a continuation. See, uh, Christ and Muhammad is one and the same. Christ has a body and a face in this uh, icon or pictorial form. The pictorial form of the Prophet Muhammad is faceless. That means that, what did the monophysites say, say about Christ? They said he had no human nature, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now they show you, they, they said that in orthodox Islam, is against the law to show any images, images. Mm -hmm. of the Prophet Muhammad, right? Mm -hmm. But when they do show you an image of the Prophet Muhammad, and I got that in my book also, an image of the Prophet Muhammad, standing next to this icon Christ. When they show you an image of the Prophet Muhammad, it's faceless. So a person or an image without a face is what? A non-human. Right. See? So that goes back to the monophysitic doctrine of Christ not having a human nature. Mm -hmm. See? Uh, in my book also I'm bringing out that this icon of Christ was given through the process of history five names. One, first one was uh, Serapis. The next one was Christ. The third one was Zeus. The fourth one was Jupiter. And the fifth one was Muhammad. See, Christ is also Muhammad. Became Muhammad the Christ in the 13th century. My book will explain all of that. Now wait for the book. Okay. A lot of people are waiting for that book. See, so. Uh, my book will dispel all the myths concerning Islam, like my book dispels the myth pertaining to Christianity. All right. Now, uh, Brother Williams, you were saying uh, how, how Europe, the Europeans managed to come in and get Africans to sell Africans into slavery. First place you have to understand this, Clemson, is this. The plan was made outside of Africa by the Europeans. The plan being that they, the Europeans, designed a plan and designated a certain area or a certain country in Africa to go in and take the human cargo, which are Africans, out of Africa and take them away from the continent of Africa and place them in other parts of the world to make slaves out of them or whatever they wish to make out of these indigenous Africans. So the answer to that question would be that the Europeans created a plan first. This was, this was nothing that was done haphazardly or by accident. Mm -hmm. They set out with a plan to do exactly what they did. So when they got to their designated country or place in Africa, they began to initiate their plan. And the plan was to take the indigenous Africans out of Africa and place them into a slave servitude position in what they call the New World, which is the United States of America. 
Okay, and they use trickery by and bribery and bribery by offering trinkets and other foolishness and other artifacts and, and, and things to the head of that particular country or head of that tribe. That's how it was done. It was planned. Um, in terms of the Afri African economy, it's been said that the Europeans undermined the uh, already existing trade routes and uh, uh, African uh, economic systems. Uh, has your study uh, uh, shown you how this was done? No, I mean the Europeans uh, show you every day how it's done because they are doing and duplicating the same thing all over the world and have done it for many, many years. Mm -hmm. uh, they set out, like I said before, and they plan their movement. This is nothing done haphazardly. So what I'm saying to you is that uh, they uh, call a meeting with the people who they're going to involve themselves into this plan and they began to initiate the plan they see what it takes to initiate the plan who is designated in their group to do certain things to bring this plan into uh, realization and they set out to do that and they have uh, the means and the whereabouts and the knowledge and the wisdom to do this so it doesn't take a whole lot of knowledge and wisdom to go in and dominate and kill and destroy and terrorize people, but this is their nature. So this is all part of a plan uh, that the Europeans had concocted to benefit themselves and dehumanize the African and other indigenous people around the world. The archives is huge, it's 30,000 hours. Yeah, I mean, digitize it, organize it, and save it for African people.